Welcome to Murder Dictionary Podcast. I'm Brianna, and that is Courtney. Hello. Before we get into the case that we covered tonight, we just want to remind you of a few things that are in our description and show notes every single week. You can always find links to our social media if you want to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. You can also find links to all the resources that we use to research our cases. So if you want to do more reading and look into them, you can check those out in the show notes. And we also have links to our Patreon. So if you want to join our Patreon and get access to bonus episodes, ad-free episodes, a bunch of perks, then you can join through that link. It's patreon.com slash murder dictionary podcast. We wanted to say thank you to the people that have joined Patreon this week, Heather, Jimmy, Raina, Andy, and Lupe. So thanks, you guys. Thank you. We appreciate you being on our Patreon, and we hope you enjoy the extra content. So I think with all that said, we can kind of get into our next Letter K Killer Kid case. Sounds good. You ready? Yeah. I'm not ready, but we're going to do it anyway. (laughs) They're all terrible. Yeah, I've already, like I was telling Courtney, I've already been crying twice today because I was looking at this case. It's a a rough one for me. So, um, yeah, these killer kids are a very difficult topic to broach. And there's just so much. With every killer kid, there's this commonality of neglect, abandonment, abuse, and all these things. But ultimately, you know, with the case, you know that someone is very tragically going to lose their life. So these ones are a little tough. Yeah. There's a lot of missed flags, usually, with killer kids. Exactly. They just slip through the cracks and people don't notice, people don't help them. They don't pay attention to the warning signs, and then we end up with these cases. So let's dive into it. Dedrick Owens was born on May 5th, 1993, near Flint, Michigan. His parents were extremely unstable, and from the very beginning, they were unable to provide a healthy home life for their new child. An investigator would later say that, quote, the day he was born, he went from the hospital to a crack house. He didn't have a chance. It's quite a statement. It's very accurate. I mean, it's just directly from being born. He was in this life that was very dangerous and not suitable for a child. Really not suitable for any human, you know? Yeah, not at all. But yeah, he was just... um, severely neglected and abandoned and you know there was no one around to really look out for him his mother Tamarla struggled with addiction so she was always getting in trouble and she had issues maintaining custody of all three of her children Tamarla worked two jobs which she found through Michigan's welfare to work program but she still had trouble affording her rent which was reportedly only $175 and this of course was quite a few years ago so I did the conversion and it's only $300 today that just doesn't seem like a lot it's not a lot of money and she's working two jobs, but I'm assuming they're not really high paying jobs. Maybe it's near minimum wage. We don't know if they're, you know, obviously I don't think they're full time jobs. That just wouldn't be possible. But I just don't know how much money she was bringing in. And if she's spending money on drugs. That's what I think is probably going on. I don't know. It didn't seem like a lot of money to me. And also, we're from Los Angeles, where the cost of living is just astronomical. So $300 seems like a, a crazy thing to not be able to afford if you're working. 
His father, Dedrick Sr., was also very unreliable and emotionally unavailable. Dedrick Sr. and his mother had successfully ran a trap house as the family business. She brought him right into it. Yeah, just, and it's very much the way that Dedrick Jr. was brought up, just straight from the hospital into the drug life. It's and just then how it works in this family. Right. The way that Dedrick Sr. reacted was by getting involved. I mean, that's what he sees his mother doing to make money. Why not, as probably a tween or a teenager, get involved? It was a very unhealthy environment for Dedrick and his siblings to be raised in. I don't really know very much about the dynamic between the mother and father, though. Did you? Because I couldn't really find much information about whether they fought or if they weren't together or. It, they were never even in the same room, as far as I could tell. Like They really had sex seemed... at least once. <laughs> well, at least Maybe a few twice, times because they had know? a couple kids. Yeah. But that was it. From all reports, it didn't even seem like they were living together, but no. they still had multiple children together. Um, just seemed like he was involved in running the trap house with his mom, and she went and raised the kids somewhere else. She was kind of separated from all that, it seemed like. And then he had gotten busted on charges and things. He was in and out. Right. So I think that maybe had something to do with it as well. But yeah, they were not like a unified couple in a relationship trying to make it work through their addictions. Right. Or, you see that on, or parenting. Yeah. You know, you it's one thing, on, the relationship. It's another thing that they're trying to raise kids together. Sometimes on intervention, you'll see them try. But this is not that case. No, it doesn't even seem like they're putting in an, any effort to really no. change the dynamic or be more present for the kids. It's good that she at least took the kids away from what dad and grandma were doing. Because that would have been worse. But if they you're were, still going to be in your active addiction, it's not much better. Yeah, they were just by themselves in the house, yeah. in this apartment. Yeah, the kids often had to take care of themselves. And they had really very little support at home. It's a, a common story that you hear when you hear of addiction and drug dealing. I mean, those are the kids that you imagine. They're at home taking care of themselves. They had no stability they're constantly being juggled around between family members while their parents are battling their legal troubles or their addiction. There was nothing stable for them. And I imagine, you know, we're talking about these children are very small. So the six-year-old is making PB&J for the four-year-old for dinner. That's Definitely. what's going on. Mm -hmm. When Dedrick Jr. was two years old, Dedrick Sr. served two years in prison for possession of cocaine on an intent to sell and burglary charges. He was released on parole, but by February 2000, Dedrick Sr. was back in jail for violating conditions of his release. Dedrick's grandmother, Lois Owens, was also sent to prison on drug charges. Every adult in his life was really in and out of prison, it seems like. In yeah. and out of trouble, fighting court cases. It seemed like his mom didn't really go to prison, but she was always fighting something. She was an acquaintance of it. Right. You know, she was adjacent. Yeah. Prison adjacent. I mean, they're just a family that's caught up in the system. And it speaks volumes of institutionalized racism, of just this family that can't break the cycle. You know, yeah. addiction and, and all of that. At the time, Tamarla had custody of six-year-old Dedrick and his eight-year-old brother, but no custody of the third child, a sister. You cannot find anything about that third child either, which is probably for the best. Right, yeah. I'm going to say. Keep her out of the story. Yeah. In mid-February 2000, Tamarla was evicted from her home. And at that point, Tamarla felt like she had no other option than to send her two sons to live with their uncle, 21-year-old Marcus Winfrey, and his 19-year-old roommate, Jamel James, in Mount Morris Township. These two men basically ran a crack house on Julia Street that was referred to as, quote, the worst house in the neighborhood. It's crazy to me, too, because this is 21 and 19 year old men that are just like, yeah, go ahead and bring your kids. And I mean, I know they're like the nephew of one, but like I know 21 year olds. I know 19 year olds. 
they are not into this. No, it does seem really strange. I mean, this was, was there a no drop other off. option. Yeah, no, there was none. There was no other option. Also, because grandma's in jail, and at this point, none of the maternal family is involved. Yeah. So this is like the house of last resort. Absolutely 100%. But it's just, it's so interesting to me that these 21-year-old and this 19-year-old are just like, yeah, go ahead, bring the five and six-year-old over. We'll take care of them. We got this. It seems just like the worst decision ever because there's got to be other adults. And honestly, it would have been better to put them in the system. That's what I feel like, especially in hindsight, of course. But I mean, when you're talking about a 21-year-old and a 19-year-old, they're not equipped to deal with having two young children to care for. And they didn't want, not, it's not like they were in some adoption list where, oh, we want to take kids right. into our environment. It's not like, oh, I know we're young, but hey, we exactly. really want to care for kids. You know, yeah, like, oh, we're 18 and we got these kids and we're going to make it because we believe and we love each other. We love our family. No. no, no, this was a transaction. And I would bet you that they were getting the 175, whatever it may be, a month to help take care of these kids. And it was kind of like a communal thing. And money talks and there's drugs and there's no logical decision. Right. right. And there's nowhere for these kids to go. And it's down the street from school. Exactly. It's close to their school. Yeah. But it's also like they had no interest in actually parenting them. They were just no. like, here, just go ahead. Stay here. You'll have a place to sleep and nothing else. And that's it. Like, we'll put food on the table. And that's and the that end. food on the table is going to be Buffalo Wild Wings. Right. <laughs> Stop. Like, you can't. No, come on. I know 21 year olds. <laughs> it's insane to me, especially. This lifestyle. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, from all accounts, it was just a drug den. It was, again, the worst house on the block. It was that house. The front yard was littered with empty liquor bottles, car parts. From what I understand, there was just a ton of trash, razor wire, just garbage. And the house wasn't even stable because there was holes in the house, broken windows, there was a tarp covering one window. It was a disaster. I it, mean, it wasn't even a fit building for them to live in. It probably looked like one of the vacant houses when people walk by and then it's like, oh shit, there's kids playing in that yard. Yeah. Which didn't happen either. But you know, oh my God, there's a little face in the window. Right. There's and it just looks there. like an abandoned house. Yeah. Like a burned out house. It sounds horrifically Holes bad. In yeah. Oh my God. Marcus and Jamel were selling cocaine out of the two-bedroom square-shaped bungalow where the two Owens boys were staying. There were people coming through the house at all hours like you'd imagine, which of course exposed the kids to drug use, gun violence, and all kinds of adult behavior that was definitely not suitable for children. Dedrick slept next to his brother on a sofa that they shared. But their sleep was constantly interrupted by a revolving door of people, drug deals, and sometimes there were deals for guns going on inside the house. The next door neighbor had actually called the police several times, but the cops never did anything. And social services was never brought in to help place the kids in a more stable environment. That's bizarre. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. It just doesn't make any sense to me. And I don't know. Of course, I say that it doesn't make sense. But then the other half of me is just like, we know that the police department in this area is spread extremely thin. We know there's a lot of information about it. The reality is that there's just not enough people working to take care of these kind of problems. Um, from what I understand, like, if the police were more involved, maybe they would have called social services. Maybe there could have been someone checking on the kids. But when the caseload of the average beat cop is way too high for them to handle in an average day, you know, these things are just slipping through the cracks. And this is the worst case scenario of that, you know. This is also a trap house, so they're going to do everything they can to keep the cops away. Yeah. So, like... There's nobody other than, you know, maybe a neighbor, somebody who has concern. Nobody is looking for even social workers, nothing. They don't want any heat at all. Nothing. And bringing in a social worker or getting these kids in foster care, 
could be the thing that brings an investigation or something. And now 21 year old, 19 year old. Oh, you guys are running a crack house. You're going to prison. Right. Yeah. It's Flint, Michigan, too. It's like there's a there's just so much going on that there's no way to just bust this one house. You know? Right. Like, They're deprioritizing this. Yeah. Definitely. And of course, the the uncle is just trying to keep it quiet, maintain some sort of peace and outward look that he's taking care of the kids. But clearly the neighbors notice, but the police aren't doing anything. He's probably taking care of them to the best of his ability. Right. Yes. I would imagine. Not great. No, it's not good. But for a 21-year-old that's just running a crack house, I mean, this is the best he can do. Yeah. That's what he's equipped to deal with is just like basic housing and food. You go sit in front of the TV. You know, Cereal, for sure. <laughs> all cereal all day. All sugar. Yeah. Just all sugar and soda. Mountain Dew. All of that. That's what I can see it. Like the coffee table. Yeah. Mm. While staying with their uncle, the boys had very little supervision, possibly even less than when their parents were around. Mostly the kids were just babysat by violent movies and television, while the adults around them were preoccupied with their own criminal behavior. Very similar to being with mom, but definitely a little bit worse because there's active drug dealing and gun dealing in the house. I mean, just the strangers coming in and out with these two little boys is like enough to send chills down your spine. Yes, Especially it's in true crime, you know, you know what this means. Right. And it's just horrific. They're left exceptionally vulnerable. Yeah. Dedrick was really struggling emotionally with being abandoned by his parents and having such an unstable home life. He began to act out more and he had frequent behavioral issues. He became much more angry and his father speculated that Dedrick's anger issues were caused by his father's absence. But there's just very little responsibility there. He says, yeah, it's just because I wasn't around, but he doesn't really express remorse for not taking care of his child. I mean, there's also a lot like, yeah, you're gone, but because you're gone, all these other things have happened. Sure. So, I mean, yeah, I guess we'll blame him. But yeah, he's like, yeah, it's just because, you know, I'm in prison. It's like, yeah. um, that's that doesn't help. But you were not there when you were out of prison. At all. You were also running a trap house. You should have been sending money to your baby's mother. That doesn't make sense to me that she's working two jobs, can barely afford $300 rent or $175 at the time. Send her a little money. I don't, that's, that doesn't make sense to me. If you're in this life, I assume that you're making some sort of money. Absolutely. This is why I think that they were not like on good terms. Right. Even, I mean, they probably, I don't know, just doesn't seem like a relationship. Seems like a one night stand turned into something else. Maybe it was a drug deal. I mean, they are running a drug house. Like, how did they meet? Right. Yeah. So it's probably something like that. And they really are not connected in any form. Not even enough for him to help support the kids financially. Yeah. Because theoretically, yeah. where there's drugs, there's money. Yeah. But he's not very good at this <laughs> because he's, you know, in and out of prison. That makes a lot of sense. It's just so frustrating because I'm like, she's just struggling so hard to make it. She is. And she can't and she's getting evicted and then they're ending up with this teenager drug house. And why can't he just provide for the kid? And it's, oh, how do I put this? God, it's impressive <laughs> that she's holding jobs. She's really trying. She's trying. Despite her addiction, like yeah. she's really, she's working. She was able to have enough stability to work. It's just the fact that when she came home, she was still really battling her addiction. She grew up in this environment. Too, right. So it's hard. Yeah. Again, it's just it's generational. It's institutionalized. It's just the system is against you. If you come from this sort of background, like it just seems like all all paths lead to just this one road, you know, because the system is designed to do that to you. So it's just there was no way for her to get ahead and therefore her child couldn't either. It's so sad. But yeah, when you hear him say things like that, it's just disappointing. Like if you know that your absence is a problem, be around more. Write you know? a letter. Send some money. Hang out with the kid. Like you know that it's a problem, but you're not doing anything about it or saying that you're sorry. 
that's the issue I have. It's one thing to state it as a problem. It's another to be like, I fucked up. I'm going to change. There was nothing from him. He's like, yeah, I'm not around. The kid's fucked up. The end. It sounds to me, since Lois is running the trap house, he didn't have an example of what standing up and being a father really necessarily would be either. So True. Oh, God. This sucks. Yeah. So, of course, we know that all these things, this sort of absence, all the the environment that he's in, cause major problems for any child that has to grow up like this. And Dedrick was no exception. Even though he was only six years old and in first grade, he was frequently in trouble at school at Buell Elementary in Mount Morris Township near Flint, Michigan. He'd been suspended three times for fighting, and he'd recently received a longer three-day suspension for more severe fighting. I mean, that's, that's a lot. You're six. Right? It's a lot of discipline from the school. for Because, like, yeah, you probably beat your brother up all the time at home. But institution is saying. This is a problem. Yeah. It's yeah. a lot. Dedrick had so many challenges getting along with his classmates that his desk actually had to be separated from the rest of the children. And I'm wondering, it's so crazy because I'm not a child psychologist, but I don't know if that's the right thing to do because then you're kind of singling him out. It's like I get it from the perspective of protecting the other children. At least there's some distance if he's physically lashing out at them. But then you're just creating this separation for him where he's singled out all the time. And I get that it's a punishment, but I'm like to permanently move his desk. I mean... What sort of message does that send? We need to be intervening in different ways. He needs counseling, therapy, all the other things we talk about. You're making a face at me. Well, I just, it's a different time because I can tell you, I'm not going to say his name, but I know exactly this kid <laughs> who from second grade. That's true. I'm to applying today's grade. logic, yeah, but yeah, exactly. this was 1993. So Yeah, this is early 90s, <laughs> nine, like I'm going to say second grade to fourth grade. I think it was fifth grade because that teacher was nuts or not nuts, but. Lovely. And um, he sat. Yeah, he was in that one, too. He was always at some point in the year. He was always. And then it was just like a thing. His desk was in front of the teachers and it did very little. You're like so jogging my memory because I remember this. Got, kid it's too. probably the same kid. There was a kid in my fifth grade class that <laughs> right? this happened to. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, looking back and now us, you know, of course, in 2019, giving a lot more credibility to child psychology and trying to treat these sort of things differently and look at behavioral issues as something that the child is emotionally dealing with. We didn't think about that back in the day. I shouldn't say we, but adults didn't think about that back in the day. Got it. You know, the teachers we. were just like, separate him, uh -huh. keep him singled out. But this does to me, it, it sends a message to the child you know that kids are acting out to get negative attention because any attention is good attention because all you're getting is neglect, abandonment, and absence from the people that are closest to you and your family, right? So these children act out and in school, they do awful things. And then you single them out and put them separately. I think it's just, it's not really addressing the emotional issues. We know this now, but back in the day, it's like, you're making it worse. He's getting a reaction. And I don't know, it's just kind of creating a further divide between Dedrick and the rest of his classmates. You know, all these kids are, quote, normal. You're the kid that's bad, quote, you know. So I don't know. I just think that it's uh, it's a really distinct difference between how we would deal with it today or how I would handle an issue with a child. But that's what the teachers were doing because his behavior was so severe. Looking back on my kid in the classroom like this, I think that he had like seriously severe ADHD. And yeah. it was it was the very beginning of like kids having to go to the nurse and get pills at lunch, their dosage, right, for medication when you were in elementary school. And his family would he wasn't getting medication. But like I knew other kids who did. They were aware of these kids, ADD, ADHD. It was on the very beginning of all this. So I, I have a feeling and it was Christian school that they didn't want to go that route. And so we all knew that in school. And thinking about it now, we didn't really make fun of him a lot because everybody knew like 
this kid isn't even necessary to make fun of. He's like, you know what I mean? Nobody like th- that sounds terrible, sounds terrible, but I hear but what you're saying. But in the kid brain, you get what I'm saying? Like, there was no point because he's he's not like the rest of us. And I mean, he, you know, whatever. He's probably a genius making tons of money and doing great in his life now, even if he's not making money, right? But at the time, yeah, that kid was separated because he had a lot of behavioral issues, probably related to an undiagnosed disorder, right. looking back. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's very much of the time. And this and Dedrick is very much of the time. Yeah. You're right. I mean, there's plenty of things that we can do now with the knowledge we have to intervene and help kids get counseling, find out what's going on. If there is a possible issue that needs medication, we can do that. But the fact that nobody's even pulling him aside and talking to him and saying, hey, you're getting in a lot of fights. I know that you're hurting. Let's have you talk to someone about this. Let's have you work on this issue. Or in the case, like you said, of any sort of undiagnosed issue within a child, it's very, very tragic when they're just not pulled aside and given the individual attention to figure out why these things are happening. The whatever it is, the fighting, the acting out, disrupting class, those are all symptoms of a problem. Those aren't the problem. Those are the things that are happening because there are problems at home. And I don't know, Dedrick was one of those kids that just slipped through and people weren't paying enough attention and giving him that individual counseling. Anyway, I just figure it was worth discussing whether that's the right thing to do. But the only argument that is definitely clear that it might be the right thing to separate him was that he was known for pinching, hitting, or kicking other classmates. And he even stabbed a girl with a pencil early in the year 2000. So in the sense that physically he is a danger to other students, I do understand why he would be separated physically from them. Yeah, I'm not hating on anybody in this one. The teacher made the right decision. Yeah. It's it okay. just it is worth discussion early on. Be it like if it was escalating, maybe if there was, you know, issues with him being disruptive or whatever, yeah. you know, doing other things and it wasn't physically a danger to other kids, I would say, you know, let's intervene there and that's where you can address mental health things, challenges at home, but if it's a danger to other kids, I get it. Now I just feel like a jerk for being like, don't separate him, (laughs) you know, but it's like, I think that it's worth having the discussion of what's the right thing to do, you know? Yeah. Are fresh fruits and vegetables a part of your day? If not, we can help. We're New Jersey Snap Ed, and we offer budget-friendly ways to help you add nutritious fruits and vegetables to your meals and snacks. For healthy recipe ideas, visit njsnap-ed.gov today. That's njsnap-ed.gov. Finding the right pros for home projects can be tough and spark a lot of questions like, how do I find a pro who can help? Will they do a good job? Will I get a fair price? That's where HomeAdvisor can help. From leaky faucets to major remodels, HomeAdvisor connects you to the right pro for the job in seconds and even helps you get a fair price. Read reviews, check project cost guides, and book appointments. Go to HomeAdvisor.com or download the free HomeAdvisor app to start your next project. He was kept late after school almost daily for flipping people off and cussing, specifically using the F word. It's all he hears at home. Right. It's really just reenacting whatever the environment is. Again, it's like this is just, you know, it's generational. It's just not being able to to see anything past what is in front of you. Yeah. A seven-year-old classmate at school, Chris Boaz, said that Dedrick had punched him because he wouldn't give him a pickle. When Dedrick's father had asked him why he wanted to fight the other kids so violently, Dedrick replied, quote, because I hate them. It's just chilling. I mean, he has so much anger inside him. It's so sad. He's Because I hate them. 
he's he's hurt you know yeah. he's hurting you know that's the the i think it's you that always says hurt people hurt people that is me yes. i mean that's dedrick he's just really really hurt the school had identified him as a high risk student because of his many behavioral and disciplinary issues at the start of the year 2000 he was placed in a new counseling program that was intended to help intervene with anger management, coping skills for at-risk youth. He was also scheduled for a meeting with an individual counselor. There may have been some improvement with his involvement in counseling, but he was still having altercations with other kids by the end of February. The fact that it was still going on, and I know it takes a lot to really make a huge difference for a child that's really struggling, but to me it says they're not doing enough, right? Yeah. Couldn't you escalate it and maybe this is one of the points where you could maybe send someone to the home to look at what's going on? The fact that you're getting group counseling and you're set up with an individual, but you're not really showing signs of improvement? Could it be acting out, though, in the fact like, oh, no, I've got to do this stupid counseling bullshit, right? So, like, you're going to react because you're a kid, so you're going to lash out. And then, like, the second time you're not, okay, whatever, I guess I'm doing this now. And by the third time you're like, I like that office. They have Jolly Ranchers. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, when you're a kid, it, everything is so serious and so, you know, black and white, up and down. Like, it's just, it's one or the other. I love it. I hate it. Right? So, I mean, I, I don't know. I think that maybe you got, you've got to let any treatment or any, you know, medication, anything like get used to it, assimilate. What's well, not assimilate, but you know. Yeah, there needs to be some in. time to acclimate to this new acclimate, program. Acclimate, that's it. Especially as a six-year-old. Mm -hmm. Six. However, I feel like if you're a professional that's trained to do this, you're a child psychologist. The day he comes in and says, they traded powder for gun. I mean, yeah, like it's time to go to the home or anything. The the stabbing a girl with a pencil, like the seriously violent outbursts, not just like smacking a kid on the head, pushing somebody down. I just think that this definitely in so many ways should have been escalated. It's one thing to be in the, quote, at risk program. Yes. Or, you know, be in the program where they're trying to teach kids anger management However, the people running these programs, if you're not getting results from the kids that are in your care and there's still violent things happening, you got to escalate it. Yeah. You know, you've got to really step in and intervene and see what's going on. That's your job. It just makes me think that even though they were trying to do things, it wasn't enough. And again, I want to have compassion for the fact that maybe they were understaffed. Maybe, you know, who knows? Maybe the the group sessions were just too many kids in it. I don't know. There's got to be something there. But it just makes me disappointed that they couldn't see that it wasn't making a difference. He wasn't improving and therefore step in and get him a higher level of care. It just is disappointing. So one of the children that Dedrick had targeted was six-year-old Kayla Rowland. Kayla, who loved ones affectionately called KK, was an active and headstrong kid who loved Barney and riding around on her bike that had bright pink wheels. She was a really good student whose family regularly joked that she was going to be the first female president. She knows what she wants is what that tells me. She knows. Yeah. She's a smart girl. She's clever. And her family believed in her, you know. I want to ride my bike. But it's cold outside, Kayla. I'm I still do what want I to want. ride my bike. <laughs> and it's got pink wheels. I'll be fine. Give me my jacket. <laughs> her mother, Veronica, worked at an auto supply factory. And because of her mother's hours, her stepdad often stepped up to take care of her. There was a report that Kayla had made fun of Dedrick for a rumored bedwetting problem. But that information is really based on rumor, and we can't really confirm it. But they had exchanged words. We know that. On February 28th, Dedrick had tried to kiss Kayla on the playground, but she had said no. Kids are a little, you know, erratic in their thinking. So I'm like, do you think that if she had made fun of him for bedwetting, he would still try to kiss her? 
because wouldn't he be mad at her and like, she embarrassed me. But, which makes me think maybe it's not true. But again, this is a six-year-old romantic logic. <laughs> so Yeah, we just never don't mind. know. It <laughs> but yeah. None of it makes sense, really. Yeah, no, none of it. But when she did tell him no, Jedrick would later say that Kayla had slapped him when he tried to kiss her. So he felt extremely embarrassed by the kissing incident, and he wanted to get even with her by scaring her, reportedly. On February 28th, the same day as that incident happened, Jedrick found a loaded Davis P-32 32 caliber handgun with three bullets in it at his uncle's house. The 32, which had been advertised as, quote, the original pocket pistol, was barely covered by a blanket and easily accessible to the kids that were in the house. The gun Dedrick found had originally been purchased legally for $109 by a local barber who was known to have a lot of guns and lived about six blocks from the elementary school. During a recent burglary of the barber's home, all of his numerous guns were stolen. Then a few months after the robbery, one of the stolen guns was traded to Dedrick's uncle Marcus in exchange for $40 worth of weed. It's just wild to me that like trade marijuana for a gun. You just in the weed game, you don't see guns. Yeah, it's Doesn't very, um, yeah, low probability of guns. in. But if you're knowing that and they have other drugs inside the yes, house. Yes, that's exactly what And we're not happens. talking about 2019 more legality of weed. We we're are in about, L.A. too. Right? I forget this every time. <laughs> we're like, talking about Michigan in 2000. Exactly. So I think that the probability of guns being there back at that time in that place makes a little bit more sense. And... I don't think it was just marijuana in the house. I think that no. weed wasn't the only drug that was happening no, there. No, absolutely not. So, yeah. Yeah, no. That's why where the guns come in. But also, it's, you know, worth noting, eventually, from what I understand, Marcus's roommate was the one that had the gun. Yeah. Right? So it was in his room. Even though Marcus bought it, I mean, these two were just working together. So eventually it, it exchanged hands to where it was in Jamel's hands. It was just in the house's gun now. Right. Yeah, exactly. Dedrick had already been exposed to guns, and he told police that he'd seen his uncle's roommate, Jamel, twirling a pistol around his finger. He also knew that guns were kept around the house without being properly stored or kept in safes. They were just really kept out very casually around the kids. There was even one gun that Dedrick had specifically seen being stored in a shoebox. Like that provides any security whatsoever. Why hide it? <laughs> like it doesn't even make sense to put it in a shoebox to me. No, it doesn't you know? at all. On February 29th, Dedrick took the stolen gun he found under the blanket along with a knife and walked two blocks to school with the weapons in his pocket. And this is like a testament also that kids are always watching and paying attention because he saw Jamel twirling a pistol around his finger, which makes me think Jamel usually probably had guns on him, so it's not the first time. Then he sees the gun in the shoebox in Jamel's room, and then the gun that he takes ultimately is under a blanket in Jamel's room as well. So it's like they, he's just watching and just seeing that Jamel's got guns around. That's all. And a gun solves your problem. Yeah, I think adults have this tendency to think that the kids aren't paying attention. Yes. Right? And so there's two things going on here. It's either that Jamel and Marcus don't really care. That's the life. And the kids are implanted into their life. So they're going to continue doing what they're doing. Or there's the possibility where they're just trying to keep a little bit more kid-friendly environment but they don't think that the kids are paying attention. Maybe the kids are watching TV when he's spinning the gun and he's like, the kid doesn't notice. He's not looking at me. He's looking at the TV. Well, kids notice everything, like you said. I think that both things were at play here. I think they weren't really willing to change their lifestyle that much, but they also, what they were doing, probably thought the kids didn't know any better, but they do. I have this visual of the two on the couch watching TV with cereal. 
And then Jamel walks in and Marcus and him are at the table behind the couch and they're sitting down talking about what's gone on today. Oh, this is that. Oh, this is bullshit. Oh, this motherfucker. And they're just talking. And he's like, we twirl our hair spinning a gun around his hand. The kids aren't paying attention, right? No. Oh, yeah. Are you kidding me? They're six. They want to know everything the grownups are doing. Right? Like, I just have this visual and I feel like I'm probably not that far off. Yeah, it seems like this was a normal occurrence. All of these things were normal to the family, to their little dynamic, you know? It's normal to have guns and drugs around the house, but it's normal for the kids to be assumed to be not paying attention when we know that they are. Definitely. (laughs) So the morning that he stole the gun and walked to school with the gun and knife, Dedrick and his eight-year-old brother also got into a fight with a boy that happened to be the 10-year-old uncle of Chris Boaz. So, again, if you remember Chris Boaz, he was the kid that previously fought Dedrick over a pickle. Yes. So now Dedrick is fighting his uncle. The uncle's 10 years old. I don't it was the it was interesting because I kept reading every time it was referred to it was the 10-year-old uncle. And I'm just like, I need a flow chart, right? <laughs> and so I broke it down. It's, it's that Chris's grandma has a kid in the same age group as his mother. Yes. And that equals a 10-year-old uncle. Right. Because I just couldn't even, like, huh? Like, it just didn't work. No, it doesn't seem like such a foreign concept to me. As as a kid, one of my close friends had an uncle we called Uncle Boy because he was our same age. That's awesome. So it it made sense to me right away. But it is a little bit of a difficult flowchart of the fights. To me, that's the thing that sticks out more is just that he's fighting so many people that he has fought this one kid over pickle and also his uncle over something else. I mean, he's fighting with everybody. You know, there isn't one person there in his class that he hasn't gotten to some sort of altercation with is what it seems. Chris's grandma, who is the 10 year old's mother, the one they got in a fight with that morning, later told the police that when he punched Dedrick, he said, quote, do you want me to take out my gap and shoot you? So clearly the implication here is just he had heard his caretakers saying gat with a T. And as a six year old, he just doesn't know how to properly pronounce it. He doesn't know what the word is, but he knows the context. He knows that this is what you call a gun. And this is what you say to someone who, like, you're fighting with, you're going about to get into a fight with. This is what you say. Somebody who's not doing what you want them to do. Yes. This is what you do. This he's is heard repeating it. repeating the behavior that you see in front of you. So this is something he's definitely heard before. I would be really rattled, too. I would report that for sure. If I heard a six-year-old say that in the context, or if my kid told me, you know, I would be really concerned. Absolutely. This is be me calling social services. This would be me reaching out to authorities like, hey, there's clearly guns in the house. You can absolutely infer that that's what's going on from this statement. Shortly after this fight, a student reported that Dedrick was in possession of a knife. A teacher got involved and took the knife away. But... She did not send him to the office or report the incident to school administration. The only thing she did was take the weapon. If she had reported the incident, he would have been taken to the principal's office where they would have done a search and they would have found the gun that he was carrying. Makes me think they find knives on these kids a lot, like weapons, like it's not as big of a deal as I think. I mean, seriously, that's what this tells me. This is way more common than we think. Kids have pocket knives. I mean, shit, switchblades, right? And grease. Yeah. You know, like kids are armed. <laughs> like, I'm, that's what I'm taking away. One of the things I, I had a similar thought when I was reading that, I was just like, well, maybe it is more common than I would think. I don't know. Maybe these little, like you were saying, just a Swiss Army knife or something like that doesn't seem very alarming to a teacher. But I just can't accept that. 
I really refuse to accept it. It just seems like it's a teacher's responsibility. A knife is a weapon, period. If you see a weapon, you have to send them to the principal's office. So I think this is just an extreme failure. But like you said, maybe it speaks to being desensitized by finding multiple weapons before. But that's just, I mean, I can't imagine living like that. I can't imagine thinking that way. I agree that it was with you. normal. You yeah, know? I totally agree. I don't want to think that, but that's all I can think from this. Yeah, that's really, it's hard to just draw a conclusion of why you wouldn't report that a kid has a weapon. But I mean, that's just one more failure in this case. Three additional students said that they had either seen Dedrick with a gun that morning or that Dedrick had pulled out a gun and shown it to them. All three of the students also told teachers that he had a gun, but it seems that they didn't take the report seriously because none of the teachers did anything about it. And that just baffles me. Not quite a pocket knife. No. It's hard enough for me to fathom that a teacher would find a knife and not escalate (laughs) the situation, especially because you assume that the teacher knows that this is a high-risk child that has a history of lashing out violently at other kids, physically hurting other children. It doesn't make sense to not escalate his possession of a weapon to the proper authorities or whatnot. And then when you hear that there's gun complaints to three teachers, you have to assume those teachers also know that he's high risk and has been violent. What is going on in this school that nobody is bringing this to the principal or any authority's attention? It doesn't make sense. I know that when I was reading about this, one of the things that they had done, like a study of the neighborhood, and that it's one of the most violent, like high crime, just really awful things they're dealing with in this community at the time. So I don't want to say that this is normal, but kids being armed and having weapons. And then later we we do have the statistics of how often kids bring guns to school, even in the 2000s. It doesn't make sense to us because we're not bringing a gun to school. Yeah, it's really, really disturbing to me that they don't do anything about this. I just can't really accept that that's what happened in this case. Yeah, it's just obviously it does speak to there's a high crime rate, there's a high incidence of weapons at school. You've got to just infer that those things are going on. There's no way to conclude that there's anything else going on than this is normal for the teachers. However, now you just know how vulnerable all these kids are. You know, it's just crazy. It just doesn't make any sense. It's hard to wrap your mind around. Nonsense. But it's normal, apparently. So, I mean, all three of these teachers didn't report it and didn't escalate the incident. It doesn't make sense to me. So the day after the Kayla incident where he tried to kiss her, which is February 29th, just before 10 a.m., About 25 kids were leaving their reading group and lining up for computer class outside. They were getting ready to go walk to the next classroom. Some kids were still lingering inside the classroom cleaning up their desks while their teacher went out into the hallway to settle down the boisterous kids outside. The police report states that Kayla and Dedrick were still inside the classroom along with a few other kids. Some accounts state that Kayla and Dedrick got into another argument and she yelled at him for spitting and standing by her desk. Dedrick took the gun out of his pocket and he aimed it at two other girls. One of the girls told him, quote, Jesus doesn't like you to point guns at someone. He doesn't. This poor girl. He doesn't like that. Oh, I can't imagine just being six and having that reaction, trying to stand up and tell another child that this is wrong, what he's doing. That is the exact reaction I had was just, oh, my God, this is what she's going to. This is her rebuttal and what's going to protect her. Right. And save her. 
this is what she's been told. And so it's just that blew my mind when I read that. As the kids were leaving class and walking up the stairs to the computer classroom, Dedrick turned and looked straight at Kayla and said, I don't like you. Kayla had been walking ahead of Dedrick up the stairs, so she turned back and responded, so? In front of 22 students and a teacher, he aimed the gun at Kayla and fired a shot that hit her in the right arm. The bullet traveled through her body and hit an artery, which caused immediate, massive blood loss. She struggled to breathe as she grabbed her stomach and neck. A six-year-old classmate said that Kayla's blood splashed the floor and described the incident saying, quote, Kayla said, I'm dying. Then Kayla didn't talk anymore. She had her eyes closed. After firing the shot, Dedrick quickly threw the gun into a trash can and then ran to the closest bathroom. Another teacher followed him into the bathroom and found Dedrick in the corner. After hearing the shot, first grade teacher Alicia Judd rushed to Kayla and called 911. When the paramedics arrived, Kayla was bleeding profusely. She was taken to Hurley Medical Clinic in cardiac arrest and was pronounced dead at the hospital at 10.29 a.m. Her mother, Veronica, was notified, and she rushed to the hospital from work, believing that Kayla had just had a minor accident. And I'm not sure what the notification was that they told her, but that's just so sad that she just believed, you know, maybe she got injured on the playground She had no idea what she was showing up to find. She's showing up to a broken arm. Right. A bee sting. Something very simple. It's, oh my goodness. When she was informed that her daughter had died of her injuries, Veronica screamed, where's my baby? And in the trauma room, she held Kayla's body, screaming, please wake up. While Veronica was grieving the loss of her daughter, Dedrick's father, Dedrick Owens Sr., was at the Genesee County Jail listening to the radio when he heard on the news that there had been a shooting at the Buell Elementary School. He says that he immediately felt a cold and sickening feeling. He instantly knew that his son, Jr., was involved. Dedrick Sr. says, all my kids go to this school. I had a gut feeling something wasn't right. And when I called home, my mom told me that it was my little boy. It's pretty crazy thinking that just immediately like, oh, my kid did this. My kid's the killer. I can't imagine. I mean, you know that that's the behavior that you're it's normal for your child. Yeah. I I just. And you know what else? He knows what this kid's been exposed to. He knows it. And he's sitting there in prison. And I mean. He knows what's going on out there. So as soon as he hears about this, like, yeah, it's a real good possibility because the kid, he has no handle on the situation. Kids with these teenagers, practically, you know, it, it, it's not that surprising. It's just kind of like a, wow, I can't believe that happened. And he, you know, story kind of thing to me. Yeah. And it's just shocking that he's so aware that Mm -hmm. his son so clearly needs help and is violent Yet, you know, there's he didn't do anything to stop that. But he knows when there's an incident of violence that his son did it. I mean, that's just crazy. When asked how he knew that his son was involved, Dedrick Sr. said, quote, because of his past violent acts, plus he watched violent movies and TV. But again, to me, it's like it screams of this lack of responsibility It had nothing to do with parenting or abandonment. We're going to just blame TV and the fact that, you know, he's a, quote, difficult kid. I mean, you're the dad. You had something to do with that. You created that. So it's very infuriating to me that he doesn't show any remorse or take responsibility. And earlier he was totally fine admitting that his son had problems, probably because of his absence. But now it's TV. Now it's video games, you know. It's somebody else's problem. It's somebody's fault. But he knew it was him, too. Yeah. There's a lot of shaky ground. 
Buckle up, because Metro is bringing you the best deal in wireless. Switch to Metro and get your choice of two awesome free phones from top brands like Samsung and LG with huge HD screens and tons of memory for all your pics and videos. So hurry into Metro and get your awesome free phones only at Metro. Plus sales tax and activation fee. Requires port and of eligible number not currently active on T-Mobile Network or active on Metro in past 90 days. Limit four per account or household. Restrictions apply. See store for details and terms and conditions. Introducing the Capital One Walmart Rewards Card. Earn unlimited 5% back on everything you buy at Walmart online. It's the perfect card for all your family's hints this holiday season. Like 5% back on the air fryer Grandpa told you about when he fell asleep in his chair. He didn't fry anything. Or 5% back on the laptop your sister had carolers sing to you. Two turtle doves and a laptop for Terry. The Capital One Walmart Rewards Card. Earn unlimited rewards, including 5% back at Walmart Online. What's in your wallet? Terms and exclusions apply. Capital One NA. As paramedics were called to help Kayla, the principal made an announcement over the PA system, instructing the teachers to lock all classroom doors. And you have to imagine at this point, they don't know if it's an active shooter that's roaming the halls or whatnot, you know. I mean, they seem to apprehend him right away, but I guess, you know, with all the issues that have happened, you always have to assume that there's something bigger at play. The other thing I was thinking is, I mean, these kids are elementary school. They're so young. So the paramedics coming through, all the authorities, I mean, that's startling enough for children to see all those people rushing in and see Kayla being taken out. So even once he's apprehended, it seems like that's the best call to keep them inside the classrooms. Definitely. Yeah. The school was closed at 11 a.m. and police were called in to do crowd control because distraught parents started arriving to pick up their children, not knowing who was safe or not. Oh, man. No, I mean, it's the worst nightmare for any parent. And, you know, it's insane the whole time. And even right now, all I can think of is, but this happens all the time now. It's so normalized rush to in a the school U.S. Yeah. Wondering if it's their kid way more often than they did in 2000. And it's just like, I'm sitting here and I just can't believe this is where we are. I'm sorry. It's continue. still happening. Yeah. And even more frequently, like you said, it's very, very tragic. Dedrick was taken to the principal's office where he was questioned by police. He was taken to the Genesee County Family Independence Agency shortly after the murder. Tamarla lost custody of Dedrick and both of his siblings, who were all placed into her sister's custody. But this is the point where I think to myself, if that was a safe home for them, why weren't they in the sister's custody before? I don't know what the story is. This is when the maternal family the mom side, right, decides that, okay, we're stepping in, we're going to take these kids. I have a feeling that this went on for a really long time with Tamarla. They had probably had been dealing with addiction, issues with her for a long time. And, you know, you see it on intervention, you see it all the time, right? Bottom line, we're done. We're not going to help support you. Difference is she's got kids. Yeah, that's the thing. When the kids are involved, I mean, take the kids out of the picture and hold her accountable in every other way, but just at least make sure they're safe. Also, the sister may have her own kids and may not have lived somewhere where, you know, she could have had all these kids or she could have taken them in. There might have been something where at the time didn't work out. And then they're put in this house. They probably are lying to everyone. Oh, they're with... Uncle Marcus, they're going to be just fine. Don't worry about it. And then by the time you you realize, you know, nothing is what it seems, Dedrick has shot someone in school and is going into foster care. It's already too late. And it's too late. And, you know, we only know what what you're told. And if they're just lying, or not even lying, but just maybe omitting the truth a little bit, right? Like, the kids still go to school. Don't worry about it. Like, but wait a minute. It just seems like it wasn't a regulated, you know, like... There wasn't an arrangement for custody. That there was, was going no child the services and anything. So to me, at all. there was also no exchange of money, right? So then it doesn't make sense why these two young men, very young men, would take custody, unofficial custody of these children. 
and not the sister who's clearly a better suited home. I don't know. I mean, I've got to give leeway where I don't know the situation. I need to be understanding about the fact that I don't know, like you said, if she had other kids or what her situation was. But it just makes me so sad that it took something this severe and violent and someone lost their life for there to be a change to the custody arrangement. I just kind of thought of something, too, is sometimes there's these families, right? Like, for example, Susan Powell, who's you know still missing, the Powell family, or the husband, Josh Powell, and his whole family of just sick, twisted, within the family, disgusting things were going on, you know, horrible shit. There's one sister that got out. And she is the one that you'll see on you're talking about how, like, no, they should have taken him. Like, he killed her. Like, she is, you know, she knows the real truth, which is that the Powell family is, like, a whole nother level of, ter- like, scary, terrifying. And she got out. And she had to completely disassociate, not speak to anybody, you know, in order to do that. And it's kind of one of those things when you're in a family. Like, maybe the sister had addiction issues and is trying to get her shit together and can't in the environment. Because her, pa- her family, it's like Trap House is the family business. So to save herself, she's got to get out. I don't know. I just, this is horrible. Yeah, I just want to have some sort of understanding for her situation and and knowing not everybody is equipped to just take in two kids all of a sudden, but there's just that other half of me that's like, this didn't have to happen. No. You know, these kids didn't have to have access to guns when you see after the fact that they were placed in another home only normal to question why that wasn't done in the first place. Yeah. It's just frustrating that they had somewhere else to go, but they were put in the place that had drugs and guns instead. And they were going to be put up for adoption, gone into foster care. Like they were absolutely just going to take these kids out of the family. And then it wasn't until after the fact, you know, then somebody came forward and it was the sister. Yeah. It's bizarre. Genesee County Sheriff Robert Pickle said on an episode of 60 Minutes that he believed the boy should be held responsible regardless of his age since a little girl had died. He also expressed that he thought Dedrick should be taken from his family and placed in professional care. On that same 60 Minutes episode, they gave the statistic that in 1998 alone, 339 elementary school students in the U.S. were expelled for bringing weapons to school, which was shocking information to many people. Kayla's tragic death was addressed by President Clinton, who challenged Congress to work harder to pass pending gun legislation. On the Today Show, Clinton said that while his gun regulation bill has stalled, Quote, every single day, there are 13 children who die from gun violence. The day after Clinton's appearance on Today, an NRA rep issued a statement saying that the parents are to blame, not the gun. God, this could have happened yesterday, huh? It's crazy. I mean, it happens every time there's a shooting. Clinton's all The NRA (laughs) issues a statement. Yeah. You know, the president responds, different government officials respond, but nothing changes. It's all the same. We're still in the same place 20 years later. Although six-year-old Dedrick had clearly committed a murder, a ruling from 1893 decided by the Supreme Court states that, quote, children under the age of seven years old cannot be guilty of a felony or punished for any capital offense. For within that age, the child is conclusively presumed incapable of committing a crime. Most states have some form of decision or legislation stating that children younger than the age of seven are not capable of understanding the consequences of their actions, and therefore they're not able to be charged with murder. Because of his young age, Dedrick did not have the ability to form intent making him not liable for the crime. So ultimately, he was never charged for the shooting or the murder of Kayla. Since authorities could not hold Dedrick accountable, they turned their attention to the adults who were supposed to be taking care of him. When Dedrick's uncle Marcus's house was searched, police found a stolen, loaded pump-action shotgun 
and crack cocaine. Their roommate Jamel was the actual owner of the gun used in the murder, and since he did not responsibly store his weapon, he was held accountable for Kayla's death. Jamel pleaded no contest to involuntary manslaughter, contributing to the delinquency of a minor and gross neglect. He was sentenced to 2 to 15 years, but he spent less than two and a half years in prison before he was released on probation. I don't see how you can give a six-year-old a sentence. I don't know that Kayla's parents feel okay with Jamel being punished. Somebody is being held responsible, but do you feel it's the right somebody? And do you hold this resentment and anger to a six-year-old child who, you know, a six-year-old will touch a hot stove? You know what I mean? They'll do things that they're six. They're a kid. I just wonder how her parents feel. Yeah, I mean, to process the loss is one thing. Um, Just nobody's supposed to outlive their child. That's just so tragic to deal with. And then on top of that, you are looking at a six-year-old to blame. You know, we see these cases where the victim's families are looking at an adult and grappling with the emotions of blaming an adult and wanting to forgive that adult. But now you look at it and apply it to a six-year-old who you know came from this terrible environment that led to this crime. So, I mean, I imagine that there's some sort of wanting accountability from someone. But is it that six-year-old? But then you look at the person who owned the gun, and even them only serving two and a half years, that doesn't seem like enough. Knowing that Dedrick is still out there just living his life, and Jamel is a couple years later out doing who knows what. I don't know. Putting myself in that situation, I have no idea. It must be just the worst sort of grappling with your feelings because it's just there's no win. There's no sort of closure where you're like, okay, the murderer got the you know appropriate punishment. This is a six-year-old we're talking about. So that's just an additional level of things to process as the family member of this victim. During all the litigation and decisions in the aftermath of the murder, there were many questions about if Dedrick was going to be coming back to the same school where he'd committed the shooting. And technically, he should, right? If he's not guilty of murder, there's no reason not to. There's no reason he shouldn't be able to. The maximum suspension the school allowed was 80 days, And since he wasn't, of course, legally found culpable for the crime, he'd have to be allowed back much sooner than parents were comfortable with. Many of the children had spoken to their parents and expressed their fear and anxiety about going back to the same school after the shooting. And in addition, you assume by extension that means with Dedrick, not only at the same facility, but with the shooter. Mm Mm-hmm. In a Newsweek article, a parent named Lori LaFawn spoke about her son being afraid to return to school. She says, quote, he's just terrified. He says, Mom, what if it happens to me? I don't know what to tell him. And it's got to be so many parents, all these parents that came not knowing what happened to their child that day. You've got to assume there's just trauma and emotions there to process. Then their children going through this or processing it. And then they're just put back in the same school with the same child. And there's just nothing that you can say to calm that child's anxiety. Of, nothing. You know, I got to go to school. And I mean, again, this is just happening all the time. But yeah, there's just nothing you can do. Kayla's funeral was attended by thousands of people. She was buried wearing blue jeans surrounded by her teddy bears. Her mother, Veronica, refused to speak to the press, but her attorney said, quote, She's enduring a natural mother's worst nightmare. She hopes something good has come out of this as far as school safety and gun safety are concerned. Mm. But it's just another time where we know that that's not the case. Yeah. 
although Kayla had lost her life, the Genesee County prosecutor, Arthur Bush, said that people should be quick to extend their sympathy and pity to the boy. Prosecutor Bush said, quote, you're talking about young children in an environment where the only thing seen was dope and guns and a few bottles or liters of pop. We're dealing with a six-year-old, not a 19-year-old. We're dealing with somebody who still believes in Santa Claus and the Easter Bunny. It's a really good statement. It, I think it explains, it's, it's a great explanation of why he feels the way he does. And I understand that point of view of just he doesn't really have a grasp enough on real adult concepts to understand the consequences of bringing a gun to school and killing someone. But it doesn't really bring peace of mind to any of the mothers that still have to drop their kids off at that school with the same kid. You know, it doesn't bring peace of mind to Kayla's mom or any of her surviving family. It's just... There's it's no, just words. Yeah. Well, I mean, what, can, what are they? Nobody's going to change anything. They're going to do anything. A month after the shooting, two hundred free gun locks were given out to anyone in Flint who wanted one, and within thirty minutes of the start of the giveaway, they ran out of gun locks. Justice Department statistics show that arrests for weapons violations in the county went up by thirty-one percent in the year after the shooting. So clearly they were trying to crack down. They're trying to do some things even locally. If the whole statewide or countrywide legislation can't change, we're still looking at solutions with gun locks and trying to crack down with the police being more strict. But again, we know that that doesn't make a difference in the rest of the the country. And we also know that there's a shelf life on that. Yes, in the year following, we're doing these things. In the month following, we're giving out gun locks. These are all immediate reactions. But what happens five years later, 10 years later? Everyone lets their guards down. And oh, it's just a matter of time before the teachers are getting weapons reports and not responding again. It's the natural cycle. At the time of the shooting in the year 2000, Kayla was the youngest victim of a school shooting in the U.S. until the shooting at Sandy Hook Elementary in 2012. Dedrick is still considered the youngest school shooter in the U.S. In 2002, parents of the children who attended Buell Elementary sued the school for negligence since three different teachers were told by students that Dedrick had brought a gun to school and showed it to them, but nothing was done about it. Yeah, they fucked up bad there. Yeah, and I mean, of course the parents should band together and say, you're not keeping our kids safe. Why should we send the kids to your school when you're doing nothing to protect them and take care of them? Kayla's mother, Veronica, also sued Beecher Community School District on the grounds that officials knew Dedrick had exhibited a pattern of violent behavior and was a known threat to other students. She's right. Absolutely. The suit also cited the teachers had known that he brought a gun to school and again failed to do anything about it. A federal judge dismissed the lawsuit, saying the district and teachers weren't at fault, but Veronica planned to appeal and continue fighting. Buell Elementary closed in 2002, citing financial troubles and low enrollment. The campus was eventually demolished in 2009. I don't see a lot of people enrolling their kids in that school if they have other options. Absolutely. The kids that were there, hopefully a lot of them got to go to another school because I think that would help them in the healing process. But then after the fact, there's no additional kids that are like, oh, I can't wait to enroll in Buell. You know, no parent is like, let me take my kid to that school. For their so, cheerleading program? Of for course. For their athletics? Like, you know, oh, I can't wait. They have to offer the kids. Yeah. So, Yeah. In the years following the murder, all of the adults in Dedrick's life would be in and out of the court system. Dedrick Sr. passed away at the age of 35 in the year 2007. 
Kayla's mother, 35-year-old Veronica McQueen, struggled deeply with the loss of her daughter in the aftermath of the murder. She lost custody of her two surviving children in 2003, when a judge found that she had failed to protect her teenage daughter from being molested by her husband, Michael McQueen. Oh, God. It's just everywhere you turn in this story, these kids are being failed, and the adults around them are just doing so much harm. Michael was sentenced to three years probation in 2004, and the couple divorced in 2005. Um, Another completely... Why aren't we divorced in 2003? Uh, But anyway, continue. (laughs) It's just alarming to me that um, he only got three years probation. Yeah, it's horrific. I'm shocked and it's just so disgusting that the court wouldn't hold him more accountable for doing something to her children. I mean, that doesn't make any sense to me. Blows my mind how often that happens. Michael Moore's documentary Bowling for Columbine discussed this case because of its proximity to his hometown of Flint, Michigan. The film shows Michael trying to deliver a photo of Kayla to NRA president Charlton Heston. In the film, he suggests that Tamarla Owens was a hardworking mother caught in the welfare reform laws that required her to work two jobs. Dedrick Owens Jr. would be 25 in 2018, and his whereabouts are unknown. Yeah. There's a lot of Facebook pages that I don't think are real that are not really him. But a lot of people are out there and trying to pretend to be Dedrick. That's weird. Yeah, it is. There's a lot of fake Dedrick Owens pages. I don't I don't understand. that. One may be real. You know, who knows? But mm, I don't think so. Oh, man. It's just there's so many levels to this story that it seems like every adult failed all of these children. Clearly, there was something going on even before, you know, of course, the loss of Kayla is horrific. But on top of that, there was something going on with her stepfather the whole time, you know. And not only is Dedrick a tragedy in this and Kayla, but clearly there's something going on with all the kids. Their siblings are still in these houses. I mean, it's just such a tragedy. Uh, There's so many levels to it. There's an article that I read that um, about this that specifically stated, and it's interesting because it comes before we find out about the molestation charges and all this. Specifically, the way they wrote it was like, mom works all the time, constantly. The stepdad helps the daughters get ready in the morning for school. Like, that's the only thing. That's it. That was what they said about him was, he helps the girls get ready in the morning. That was it. And, I, and then years later, you find out, you know, it's just, I don't know. It sounds like she was gone a lot. And that seems to be the issue in a lot of this story is just that the parents had to work long hours. There was just not enough supervision. They weren't present enough, you know. I mean. It's like a form of a rat race, you know. You just can't catch up you're never gonna get ahead you know and it's just wears you down and then you know just the area itself flint we know has had so many problems just michigan in general you know closing factories all this stuff it's not exactly a light-hearted vibe you know especially this time this neighborhood everything just the environment was very down it was not a place that was going to be seeing huge growth Art and culture, right? It, not that way. A lot of empty houses, vacant homes, a lot of that. And a lot of children that are trying to survive in it because their parents can't make ends meet. That's what I think of. Like, like Newsies kids running this, around. These kids are really just, you know, one story. You know, Kayla and Dedrick are one story. And that's so much bigger of a problem that's happening in currently, still happening in Flint and so many other places. These aren't the only kids going through this. You know, at the time of this, too, the government of Flint is like in the process of making all these 
decisions to actively poison the citizens with their water. The government was so corrupt and there's so much like financial diversion and stuff like that going on at the time that there probably was no budget for child services, social workers, protective care, stuff like that to really, like you were saying, there's just not enough people. But I think it's double because it's also like the Flint, that area. All the corruption that yeah, we know is the corruption happening is just, in Flint. Yeah, we know that, the yeah. There's definitely, even still today, just a lack of funding for their Clean police, water. for their, you know, yeah. all these services, like you said, the child protective services, anything like that. If you're trying to save money, those are the things that we have seen have gotten cut. So this was just one story of so many where the kids are slipping through the cracks, where it's just... Uh, generations of poverty and we can't really protect anyone. There's just nobody is being uplifted out of this system that's designed to oppress them. It was a rough one. Yeah, I, I just, I really feel for the surviving family and all the people around them that know that it could have been their child because they're all enduring the same problems that are happening in their community and all the kids attended this elementary any survivor of a school shooting it just breaks my heart because it just it's a lottery it's just it could have been anyone yeah. and for the parents they know that it could have been any of their children and it just breaks my heart and we're still going through it all the time and it's happening all every day in the US so Nothing has really changed. And I wish that these stories would result in some sort of happy ending where at least at minimum, if someone lost their life, we could see some sort of change or growth and, you know, uh, issues that um, really affect so many young kids are not given the priority to really make changes in our country. We're still going to deal with them as we're seeing 20 years later. Yeah. And if it doesn't change... It will be saying the same thing 20 years from now. So it's just, this is not really the exception to the rule, it seems. This is kind of the norm in this community is what you get the feeling of from the parents and everybody around them. So it's just so sad that they weren't able to get him some sort of intervention from Child Protective Services or social services earlier. You know, he really needed to be cared for. He really needed someone to come in and, and help him. Yeah. He's six. Six years old. I can't even believe that. Yeah. So that's the story of Dedrick and Kayla. Yeah. Then that's pretty much the end. <laughs> Are we done with Killer Kids? Not yet. We've we have got one more. One right? more. Oh my god! I'm sorry. It's fine. I'll be. I'll live through it. But you know. Yeah, it's very heavy, and I will be relieved to move on because I really don't want to cry as much as I've been crying. You I know, I don't want you to cry <laughs> as much as you've been crying either. My God. So, with all that said, we will be back next week with another killer kid. And in the meantime, we want to thank the people that joined our Patreon this week: Heather, Jimmy, Reina. Andy, and Lupe. Thank you. Thanks, you guys. So if you want to join our Patreon, it's patreon.com slash Murder Dictionary Podcast. You'll find the link for that along with our Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter and our resources that we use to research in the show notes. So I think that's pretty much it for us. If you want to get access to those bonus episodes and ad-free episodes and stuff, just go over to our Patreon and head over to all of our social media and come chat with us. And then we will see you next week. Yes, you will. Woo. Bye. Bye. We all have songs that remind us of our first love and bands that make us think of a certain friend. Maybe you have a workout playlist or a favorite album to listen to on road trips. But do you ever wonder what was going on in the lives of the artist when they wrote the music that you connect to your own memories? Rockumentary Podcast fills in the blanks on what you may not know about the iconic artists making the music that's so meaningful to our own lives. Each episode is an in-depth biography 
spanning from a musician's childhood through all the challenges of their journey to success and how they handled finally achieving fame. On Rockumentary, you'll hear about Kurt Cobain becoming a janitor at the same high school that he dropped out of, or how Jimi Hendrix was kidnapped and held for ransom for two days. Our episodes include details about Notorious B.I.G. marrying Faith Evans after knowing her for only a week, and Phil Spector pulling a gun on the Ramones when they tried to end a long recording session. You may know the music, but on Rockumentary, you'll hear the stories behind the songs. Search for Rockumentary on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever else you like to listen to podcasts. Finding the right pros for home projects can be tough and spark a lot of questions like, how do I find a pro who can help? Will they do a good job? Will I get a fair price? That's where HomeAdvisor can help. From leaky faucets to major remodels, HomeAdvisor connects you to the right pro for the job in seconds and even helps you get a fair price. Read reviews, check project cost guides, and book appointments. Go to HomeAdvisor.com or download the free HomeAdvisor app to start your next project. Buckle up, because Metro is bringing you the best deal in wireless. Switch to Metro and get your choice of two awesome free phones from top brands like Samsung and LG with huge HD screens and tons of memory for all your pics and videos. So hurry into Metro and get your awesome free phones only at Metro. Plus sales tax and activation fee. Requires port and of eligible number not currently active on T-Mobile Network or active on Metro in past 90 days. Limit four per account or household. Restrictions apply. See store for details and terms and conditions.